Hello, this video is entitled Basic Integration Rules, which is a chapter from the uh, Larson textbook. Now the name is a little deceiving of this section. It sounds like something from Calculus 1 where you're just learning the basic antiderivative rules, but that's not really the case here. And we'll talk about what we are going to be learning here in this section in just, just a moment. So. I just put up some examples of some integrals that from past that we could do, um, one you see we can't do, and just kind of mention without working them out what, what they're going to be. Well, it kind of tells you right here in red. This first one um, would be, would fit arctan perfectly. This next one, would, next one would be natural law because it would just be a U substitution and you have a U to the first power on bottom. That's what makes it natural log. Next one, you would have to do divi division first and you would also end up with arctan and this answer, but another term after you do the division because anytime you have an improper fraction with the uh, larger power, uh, greater than or equal to power on top than bottom, it's division. So squared and squared or anything higher on top. Have to divide before you can integrate it. The next one in this row would actually fit perfectly for arc sine. Now the next one, because we have an X on top, it would be just U substitution, power rule, but not natural log because you have to the one half power on the bottom, which will then be of course negative one half when you pull it up. And this one would involve a technique that we have not learned yet in Calculus 2, but we'll see it later this chapter. So this, uh, this section basically is a review of previous integration rules and techniques as we prepare for more advanced techniques later. But there are three new ideas I'd like to introduce here in this section that certainly would consider putting you know one or two of these on an exam. So I would pay close attention to, to these three topics. And of course, anything that comes from earlier is still important to know how to do because that could always come up somewhere down the road. One of them is called the disguised form of the log rule. The next one's called using conjugates to integrate trig functions and then integrating by completing the square. So let's look at the first one, a disguised form of the log rule. Now what that means is it's going to end up being a natural log result, but the original integral, uh, you cannot do substitution to it. You have to uh, multiply by something to get it into a form to where you can do substitution. And once you see the technique, it's not a very difficult technique. Thank goodness, it's pretty easy. And now let's look at this integral, this first example. 2 over 7e to the x plus 4. Now we can't just let u be the denominator here because if u is going to be 7e e to the x plus 4, we would have to have an e to the x in the numerator to be part of the du, and we do not. So in this form, we cannot do substitution for a log until we do this little trick to it. That's sort of the reason behind the term disguised. It means it's hitting, hidden, hidden, but you have to bring it out. It's in hiding, but we're going to find it. So the technique is to multiply top and bottom by e raised to whatever the opposite power of the exponent is. So in this case, you have C7e to the x down there. That means it's e to the positive x. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by e to the negative x. So it's always the opposite. And you'll see how the next example works when it's negative. Well, anyway, so top and bottom, then I pull the 2 outside. We're not worried about that. Now, 7e e to the x times e to the negative x would just be 7 because e to the x times e to the negative x would just be e to the 0, adding exponents. That would be 1. Or you can look at it as e to the x divided by e to the x. And that will be 4e to the minus x. And then we'll have a minus e to the x on top. Oh, 
forgot the should use the proper form here sorry about that let me squeeze it I'm not using a stylus here so I'm having to use a mouse pad for this so yeah I should have DX in there but everything else is okay there we go. All right. Now that works because now you can let U be the denominator. Because if you got an E to the negative X on bottom, when you take the derivative of it, you're going to get an E to the negative X on top. So U is going to be 7 plus 4E to the negative X. However, when you take the e derivative of E to the negative X, you're going to get negative E to the negative X. And of course, this one just has a 4. I was speaking more in general terms. But this one will be negative 4E to the negative X. Because the chain rule, the derivative of negative X is negative 1. And then divide both sides by negative 4. So you have negative 1 fourth DU equals E to the negative X DX. And now, now we're in good shape because you have this negative one-fourth right here, the two that was already with the problem. You just have du over u. That's natural log. I didn't, I guess I could have put the numbers in front of this, but I have the numbers correct right here in the answer. Don't worry about that. It's not there. That's going to be negative one-half. And then natural log of u, which is 7 plus 4e to the negative x, absolute value, plus c. So the original integral did not have e to the negative x, but the answer did. Because that's the only way we're going to get this to work. So, very good. Let's take a look at this one now with 5 integrating 5 over 3 plus e to the negative x. Same, same thing. We cannot use uh, u in its original form. So, since this is an e to the minus x, we're doing top and bottom by e to the positive x. It's always the opposite sign of whatever that exponent is. That's going to give me, a, I pulled the 5 out, it's going to give me e to the x on top, 3e e to the x, and then e to the x, negative x times e to the x will just be 1. So then we let u be the denominator, and therefore du would be just 3e e to the x dx, divide both sides by 3, and that will give me one-third du equals e to the x. So we have this 5 from the original problem, the one-third that comes from the du, and now you have du over u. So I just skipped a step of writing the natural log, go straight to the answer here. Natural log of u. I just have natural log of what u actually is. So we have five-thirds natural log of 3e to the x plus 1, absolute value of that, plus c. That's, that's really all there is that's, uh, for that, that technique. It's either going to be e to the x or e to the negative x multiplied by the opposite. Conjugates to integrate trig functions. So this integral is um, 1 over 1 minus cosine of x. We can't use substitution here because there would have to be a sine of x in the numerator. If there was a sine of x in the numerator, we would just let u be the denominator, and then the derivative would give us that sine of x. So we have to use conjugate. Conjugate is when you multiply by a binomial with an opposite sign between the terms. So the conjugate term of 1 minus cos x would be 1 plus cos x. So top and bottom, same thing, 1 plus cos x. So it's going to leave me a 1 plus cos x on top. And then um, you'll get 1 minus cos squared of x on bottom. And of course, 1 minus cos squared of x equals sine squared of x. So this is good. You, so you can't split up fractions in that original form like that. No way. But you can split this up. So it's 1 over sine squared of x plus cosine over sine squared of x. Now let's think about how we're going to Integrate that 1 over sine squared of x. I got a little Stewie says coming up here. I'll just go ahead and bring it, look at it right now. Uh, you can never integrate a constant divided by a trig function, by whether it's raised to a power or not. So you see this 1 over sine squared. It could be 1 over sine. The power doesn't matter, but you can't integrate that directly. You have to rewrite it as its reciprocal trig function. 
So the appropriate step for 1 over sine squared is to convert it to cosecant squared, and we'll deal with that in a minute. Now this one, cosine over sine squared, that's in perfect u du form, because you can let u be sine of x, and that will get your cosine of x as your du on top. So you'll have the du perfect fit, nothing to adjust for, perfect fit on top, and that'll just be u squared on bottom. So for this integral, it's going to be u to the negative 2 du. Now for cosecant squared, there's not really a technique for this. You just need to know, since the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared, that means the antiderivative of cosecant squared would then be negative cotangent. And that's it for that one. That's the antiderivative. And then this one, the antiderivative using the power rule for u to the negative 2 would just be negative u to the negative 1. Now you can uh, substitute back in u as sine. Uh, one of my handwritten exams, I wouldn't have a problem with the answer being just left like that. That's not inverse notation, by the way. That is sine of x raised to the negative 1 power. But you know, a lot of times some instructors may want it this way, or if it's in multiple choice format, you would most likely see this rewritten since that's one over sine. You'd probably see the answer written for that for that term to be cosecant. So sort of the simplified answer would be negative cotangent x minus cosecant x plus c. Let's look at the second example of this type of problem. It's going to be dx over secant of x minus 1. Once again, we can't use u substitution. Now for this one, you would have to have a secant times tangent in that numerator because that's the derivative of secant. So we don't have that, so we're going to go the conjugate path here. Sec plus 1 over sec plus 1. And that'll give me, of course, sec plus 1 on top. Now, skip the step. I'll scroll down here where you can see this. That's, that's secant squared minus 1 when you multiply that denominator out. But look right here, tan squared equals sec squared minus 1. So there's tan squared on bottom. So we'll split this up into two fractions. We have secant over tan squared of x plus 1 over tan squared of x right here, which then, like I was just saying, because you never have 1 over a trig function or any constant, you have to write that as cotangent squared. This one's a little bit tricky. And same thing with if you were integrating tangent squared by itself. We're going to see that a little bit later in this chapter. Um, but cotangent, unlike cosecant squared, cosecant squared has, to, has a natural antiderivative. Cotangent squared does not. However, if you use this identity that relates cotangent squared to cosecant squared, that will solve it for us. So we're going to write this part right here on the, on the right, cotangent squared, we're going to write it as cosecant squared of x minus 1. Now this one kind of technically involves something we're going to learn a little bit later in this chapter. Sort of jumping ahead, but that's all right. It's not that severe of a rule. Secant over tan squared has no real way to handle this by substitution. So with the technique we're going to see later is, is converting it to sines and cosines. But that's not so far advanced technique that we can't go ahead and just use it now. So that's what we're going to do. So I rewrote secant as 1 over cosine. Tan squared is sine squared over cosine squared. And, oh, it looks like I skipped a step here, unfortunately. Sorry about that. But anyway... Let me explain what happens here. When this flips over and the cosine comes down, I'll just say it verbally, that'll be good. You'll have a cosine on top and a sine squared on bottom. So you're going to let u be sine of x, du be cos of x dx. And that's then just, so that will, that will take care of the numerator completely, the dx part, no adjustments necessary. And you end up with just u to the negative 2. So this ends up being cos of x over sine squared, which is u to the negative 2, which is negative u to the negative 1. Now this one, just like the last one, the antiderivative of cosecant squared will be negative cotangent. 
and then negative 1 will be negative x. Similar looking answer to the last problem, isn't it? Except it has that x in there this time. And this one being, so once again, technically negative 1 over sine, that's mathematically correct. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but I just went ahead and wrote it you know, just to show you as its equivalent reciprocal trig function would make it cosecant of x. But both of these are actually correct. One of them just kind of has out the, the fraction out of there. So, All right, now let's jump down here to completing the square. So we're trying to get this quadratic into a form to where you have a square in parentheses because you can still then you that may lead you to all kinds of possibilities like arc tan arc sine uh, some of the, the natural log functions that we used in uh, hyper the section on hyperbolics but anyway so we can't really integrate this in this form right here so we want to get this into a binomial so completing the square so we're going to focus on the x squared plus 8x and just leave the 41. You just leave that sitting there. So to complete the square, to create a binomial, you take half of, that's what I'm writing up here, m over 2, half of that coefficient, 8, and then squaring it. So 8 over 2, 4, 4 squared, 16. So 8, that gives you x squared plus 8x plus 16. Now one thing to keep in mind, this is not an equation. It's not like it's x squared plus 8x equals 41. Because it, in an equation, whatever you would do to one side, you would do exactly to the other. So if I was adding 16 here, and this was an equation, I would add 16 to the other side. But this is what's called an expression, not an equation. So if we add 16 right here, I've got to subtract 16 to balance this out. Because look at that expression right there. See, if you, if you combined it, the 16s would cancel, and it leaves you what you have originally under the radical. So you have to do an add, then a subtract. So don't confuse that with an equation. Don't add 16 twice. Um, well, we will be adding twice here in a minute, but not for that reason. And that means x squared plus 8x plus 16 factors into x plus 4 squared. And then you have 41 minus 16 is 25. Now we haven't had any up to this point arc functions where uh, the u is a binomial, but there's no reason why we never said it couldn't be a binomial. You know, usually it's just a term like x or 2x or something like that. But no, that's perfect. There's no, there's no reason why u can't just be x plus 4 right here. That's fine. So u is x plus 4, du is dx, and then a would be the square root of 25, which of course is 5. And then that simplifies into this arctan form right here, du over u squared plus 25. And there's the formula for it. So it's 1 over a, it's 1 over 5, arctan of u over 5. So it's 1 fifth arctan of x plus 4, which that's your u, over 5 plus c. So now we have binomial terms for our u when we complete the square. Now with, with a minus, it's a little bit tricky here, so you have to be careful. But once you kind of see the pattern here, it won't be so bad. So I have negative x squared plus 4x. It, it just didn't have a number at the end. That's not, you know, it doesn't have to have a number there. Uh, this one did not. So to complete the square, you want to pull a negative out of these two terms. You want to only complete the square. You want x squared to be positive. So I, I moved the negative. That leaves that x squared. And of course, that changes the 4x into negative 4x. So in the inside the parentheses, you have x squared minus 4x. So I take half of negative 4, which is negative 2, square that. That's positive 4. Now, the last problem you saw that I showed you where I added 4, then I immediately subtracted 4 to balance that out. Well, we don't do that this time because this is different. Because there's a negative on the outside of the parentheses, when you add a 4 on the inside of the parentheses, you're technically adding a, a value of negative 4 to the expression. 
So you then have to add another positive 4 to the outside of the parentheses. So that's what I was saying a minute ago when I said we're about to see, you know, when you go add, add, back to back. So basically, if, if the x squared is positive in the original form, you'll go plus than minus. If it's a negative, you'll go plus inside the parentheses and plus again. So it just follows that pattern. Now I rearrange this to make this, the minus will always go at the end here. So I put the four, so I just took, so complete the square in the inside here. It's x minus two squared. Yeah, no, no integral form is going to look like negative u squared plus a squared. It, I just put the four in front to make it look like something. And it definitely looks like something. It looks exactly like arctan. So uh, 2 over 4 minus x minus 2 squared, square root of that. You let u be x minus 2, du is dx, a squared is 4, a is 2, and it fits arc sine perfectly. So now you have 2 arc sine x minus 2 over 2 plus c. And I did this one in maple just to show you. And all maple did here in the parentheses was just it split it up in the two terms where it divided them by two. But we got it right. All right, very good. Let's take a look at another one. Now this one's interesting because it's going to be completing the square, but our trinomial under there doesn't, you know, doesn't have an x squared and an x. It has an x to the fourth and x squared. And that this is a, a, a term, you, you know, from a while back in algebra, and it's certainly okay if you don't remember this term called quadratic in form, meaning it's not quadratic, but it has a quadratic type of form if your leading coefficient of the x is twice as much as your x coefficient. So the normal quadratic, of course, has an x squared and x to the first. But since this one has an x to the fourth, and an x squared, that's called quadratic in form. So example, if this was x to the sixth and this was x cubed, that would be quadratic in form as long as it's twice as much. So we can still apply the completing the square technique. It's just a little bit different, but it's not that bad. It still works exactly the same way. So this time I'm going to, so you got a negative there. So I'm pulling out a negative. That's going to leave an x to the fourth in here and a minus 8x squared to get, because it was plus. But then don't put the plus 9 in the parentheses. You leave the plus 9 to the outside. Remember the last problem. The first example had a number. The second one didn't. Now this one does. So leave the 9 sitting there. And we complete the square as normal. We forget, don't worry about that's a fourth and a squared right now. Just take half of negative 8. Square it, which is 16, and we add 16 in the parentheses. Now, because we added 16 in the parentheses, that follows a negative sign. That means it's really negative 16, so it needs a positive 16 to balance it out. So once again, like I said, if you've got a negative outside of here, it'll be add, then add both times. So now this time we have something to add with the 16, so it's 9. And I rearrange the order. So I, but see that when it factors, oh, it's not x minus 4 squared. It's always whatever half of this power is. So this is x squared minus 4 squared. And that's what goes under the radical. It still fits. And let's see. Oh, I forgot. Sorry about the, I didn't show this part here. So the u, I kind of, well, it's up here, but. There it is. Maybe I should have done it after this. It doesn't matter. But the u ends up being x squared minus 4 from right here. I'm not going to change the look of this around, but it's kind of pointing up here. Maybe that should have been after this. U, du is 2x. So then that way, 1 half du equals x dx. So obviously, you know, this for this problem to work, that x had to be there. So uh, when it's just x squared and x, there won't be an x there. So then it's all designed for you know these to be solvable. So there's where this one half is coming from right here. Yes, yeah, from right up up here. So I got one half du over the square root of 25 minus u squared. Perfect arc sine. And it's one half arc sine of u over 5. So it's one half arc sine of x squared minus 4 over 5 plus c. 
Maple doesn't put the plus C in there for some reason. I guess they just figured that the user will know to do it. And the maple just split the fraction up there. And they have theirs in different order too, but it's, it's equivalent to my answer. That's all that matters. Now the rest of this section is, you know, I'm, I'm could have gone on and on forever, just a variety of other types of integrals. This one's kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's kind of ch very challenging on choosing the U. It's kind of what I like about it. Um, Theoretically, I probably could have asked this one back in Cal 1, although I don't, I don't think I would have wanted to do that on a Cal 1 exam, nor probably Cal 2 either. But it's just anything that kind of gets you thinking on how to choose your U and DU is always good because it's kind of, kind of tricky. It's not so obvious what to do. But, you know, when you're, you're picking things, that's why, the, you know, we have erasers. And that's why we can start over. If you're not exactly right, you can change your mind. So skipping all the possible trials and errors here, U actually needs to be natural log of cosine, not just cosine, because there had to be a negative sign there or any, or any kind of sign there. If you let U be natural log of cosine, look what happens when you take the derivative. Because the derivative of natural log of something is the derivative of that something divided by that something. So essentially it's it's, the derivative of cosine over cosine. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine over cosine. So I have negative tangent. And then that's perfect. That's a perfect fit. Well, we have to adjust for the negative, but still, that's a good fit because it gets you that tangent in front. So the negative comes out. So your tangent dx is your du. Ln of cosine of x is u. And it's amazing how uh, simple that this comes out to be after looking so messy looking you're just with the, excluding the negative there which is there but all you're integrating here is u du so it's, I, I find this problem fascinating because the choice of u is challenging but the integral is easy so that's just one half negative one half u squared using the power rule because of the negative out here and it's just so it's just negative natural log of cosine of x squared plus c so i found that problem entertaining This is one I would have, you know, certainly discussed in Cal 1 for sure. Both of these next two involving E's. Now the first thing you want to do with an E integral is, is a basic e integral is look to see if the exponent can be your U. Now we already saw that that's not true all the time when I did the disguised form of the log rule, but this is sort of the first place you start. And if that works, you're good to go. So if you let u be cotangent of x, the du will be negative cosecant x squared x dx, and then that, then that worked perfectly. So we just have to adjust for the negative because your du gets your cosecant squared of x right there. And then you just end up with negative e to the u du. And e to the u du is a wonderful antiderivative because it's just e to the u. So it gives me negative e to the cotangent x plus c. Now, and that's it for that one. Same thing with this next one. Looks kind of weird written like this. Now I brought this, I wrote it up this way, you know, get a, kind of get it elevated out of fractional form so the u and du will make a little more sense. So I wrote it like this, where that 1 over t is just t to the negative 1, and I brought up the t squared makes that t to the negative 2. And then so if you let u be the exponent, which is the correct move here, t to the negative 1, take the derivative of that, that's negative t to the negative 2. And then there, now it fits. But we're just off by a negative sign here again. Just coincidentally, it's off by a negative like the last one. Not always going to be the case, but for this one. So yeah, so it ends up just being negative e to the u du. So same thing. Negative e to the u. T, either, yeah, just t to the negative 1 would be fine with me, you know, for testing purposes. But I just wrote it back as 1 over t here to make it look like the original problem. So negative e to the 1 over t plus c. Yeah, so that's just kind of a summary of 
old school integrals. Now this, this one's interesting. It's it's an arc sine, you know, which is, is but uh, it could be a little kind of tricky here, you know, picking the u and du. But the thought process on this, first of all, you can't let u be what's under the radical because the derivative of x to the eighth is x to the seventh. So if that was x to the seventh on top, then you could let u be what's under the radical. So that's not going to work. But then you think, okay, what does u need to be whose derivative, the power of x, whose derivative will give me third power when I differentiate it? And that would be x to the fourth, because the derivative of x to the fourth is going to give you x to the third. Now over here specifically, it's going to give you 4x to the third. So you divide both sides by 4, so it's 1 fourth du equals x cubed dx. And then that works perfect for here because if u is x to the 4th, u squared is x to the 8th. And then a squared is 7, so a would just be the square root of 7. Remember that a squared doesn't have to always be the square of an integer. Just a lot of problems it, it is, you know, so it's not uncommon for that. So I just wanted to show you a different look here. Nothing wrong with that. a can be the square root of 7. That doesn't hurt anything. So here's our one-fourth, so we just have du over the square root of 7 minus u squared. That fits perfectly into arc sine. So it's 1 over 4, arc sine of x to the 4 over the square root of 7. I'm the type of instructor that I, I'm not picky about rationalizing the denominator. I don't have a problem with the square root of 7 on the bottom. Maple rationalized it, but obviously that's instructor's choice, so... If you're watching this and you're not taking a class from me, your instructor might would want that rationalized. It's totally their call. But I'm just saying personally, I don't care. And there we go. So, okay, let's see what we got here. Now, this one's interesting. I won't go through the whole spiel because it's pretty much exactly the same as this one, but it's a plus instead of a minus. So the only difference is... Everything sets up exactly the same, so I'll skip all that part. But because it's a plus down there, it's a just a different integral form this time. That's the only difference. It's not arc sine. It's this natural log one right here. That comes from the section on uh, hyperbolic functions. Technically, it's an inverse hyperbolic function, but I just teach this to where we only use these these log forms right here. I don't, you know, once again, some instructors may want you to call that an inverse hyperbolic, but I just go with natural log. But that's because of the plus. So really, everything's the same. It's just how you choose your answer because of this form and this integral. So it's one fourth natural log of x to the fourth plus the square root of seven plus x to the eighth plus c. All right, let's take a look at this example. This good basic trig one here. It's going to end up being arc. Now, you can't let u be the whole denominator because sine, the derivative of sine squared is not just cosine because the chain rule. Actually, the derivative of sine squared would be you bring the 2 down, 2 sine x. You take the derivative of sine x, which is cos x. So actually the derivative of sine squared x is 2 sine x cos x. So you would need another sine there on top. But if you let u be sine of x without the square, then it fits the du of cos x, and then you just square the u. So you let u be sine of x, du is cos x dx, and then u squared will be sine of squared of x. So that's how you get the square, is by squaring u, not letting u include the square. If that makes sense. So yeah, the U doesn't include the square here. And it sets up perfectly for arc tan. Because now you just have DU over 4 plus U squared. That means it means A will be 2. So it's 1 over A, 1 over 2, arc tan of U over 2. And U is sine, so it's 1 half arc tan of sine of X over 2 plus C. And that concludes this video on basic integration rules.